Second Chronicles chapter 34 verses 14 onwards to the end. The last Sunday of October is customarily remembered by churches, Protestant churches, to give thanks to God for the great revival that God has brought in the history of the church. Unfortunately, unfortunately, most Protestant churches today do not even know there was such an event. They are not interested. Today, Protestant churches are no more protesting. But they are compromising. They are busy trying to negotiate with the Roman Catholics to go back and become one. And they are deluded and seduced to think in these days that Roman Catholics are truly Christians. Even though they would worship Mary or pray to the dead saints or bow before the idols or believe in other unbiblical doctrines. This is a shameful thing. Uh, this is a terribly erroneous and dark thinking. May God deliver us from such a situation. But today we want to remember that the spiritual battle is not something that ended with the Reformation. In fact, the Reformation actually tells us that the battle has to continue. The battle for the Bible the battle for the truth that Jesus is the only Savior and none else. And that only by grace through faith we can be saved. And we must do not for man's praise but for the glory of God. It's still a point of contention. And it has to be because the devil is most displeased. That the church would remember these great doctrines. Now... Do you know, dear friends, this battle is everybody's fight. I mean every believer's fight. You should never think it belongs to certain pastors and theologians. The Reformation was a unique and a powerful movement because there were many who were moved by the truth of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ rendered their wholehearted support to the Reformation leaders. Martin Luther, Swingley, John Calvin, all these great names that we often remember were sustained by constant support of men and women who were ready to protect them, support them and help them even with their own lives. Many, many were tortured and killed for the truth. And their names are not known to us, but known to God. Their names are written in the book of the Lamb, and they will be called on that day and we will meet them. Some were thrown before the wild animals to be torn asunder. Some were tied to the trees and set on fire. Some were tortured with horrible, violent machineries. Their limbs were pulled apart. They were stretched beyond their muscles and sinews could take. Their, their limbs were ripped off from their bodies. They were, their eyes were plucked off. Horrible torches. Horrible. And that they believed. And then they did, did not deny. They confessed that Jesus Christ alone is the Savior. 
and all that he has uttered through his prophets and apostles, which is now recorded for us in the Bible to be true. They refuse to accept that the Bible must be understood uh, together with the traditions of man. They said, Sola Scriptura, only the Scripture. They did, they, they did not agree with the church that said, Scripture and the traditions of the church. They denied the traditions of the church, especially those that contradicted the Bible. Every tradition of man, whether within or without the church, that contradicts the Bible must be thrown out. So they said with one voice, Sola Scriptura. And that broke down the resistance of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible became a very beloved book. For about thousand years, the years that preceded 1600s, the book, of the, the book that we love today and so lovingly hold in our hands and read from page to page was a forbidden book. The light of this book was not allowed to shine. And the church made sure the people will be kept away from the truth so they can be purchased with their false beliefs, rituals, and enslave them for the benefit of those who are in the authority of the church. And many were groping in darkness because they didn't know what was the truth until the Reformation took place. And we thank God for that event. And I want to bring to your attention an old Reformation that occurred even before our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. In the history of Israel we see this. God was revealing His truth through His prophets. God gave to Israel the first five books of the Bible which we know which we refer to as the law or the five books of Moses. The first five books were written by the great prophet Moses, the great leader of Israel. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. These five books were to be the guide of God's people. It had to be the foundation of the monarchy of Israel. All the kings of Israel who followed King David were expected to live and reign based on God's truth. They were to be the guardians of the Bible. They were expected to propagate the truth and promote godly religion based on the Bible. But sadly, the kings of Judah have wandered away from God. And they started to Embrace the religion of the heathen nations around them. They started to bring in the names of gods of the pagan world into their country. And before the temple of God, they have altars dedicated to other gods. And that's what we read in today's scripture reading. Now bring your attention to Second, um, second Chronicles now, please. In the midst of such terrible, terrible atrocity, we see God started His work. Now, if you were to look at Second Chronicles chapter 33, toward the end of that chapter, which would give you some understanding of the background of this passage, we read this way, verse 21, Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. Look at that sad situation. 
Manasseh and his son Ammon both were sacrificing unto carved images. They desecrated the temple of God. The whole land of Israel was filled with idolatry. Almost every corner of that country you will find some sort of wickedness. You know, the idol worship often bring many evil with it. Because those idol worships also have sexual immorality. They have temple prostitutes. They even have homosexuals. And such wickedness was rampant. You see the same fact in 2 Kings as well. And we will look at it later on when we come to that in, in the course of my message. But now take note, it was at this time of spiritual degeneration and utter idolatry, God by his providence raised a young boy. And I hope all the young boys would listen to me now. And not only now, throughout today's message. And this is not just for adults. For everyone, whether young or old, to take note. Look at verse 1, chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. Eight-year-old boy coming to the throne. Can you imagine that? Where are our eight-year-old boys? They are having a special class. Why? Because most parents believe that they are not able to sit here and listen to Pastor Koshi preaching for one hour. They might fall asleep or that they can comprehend everything. Even if they sit here, maybe they will get less than 10% of what Pastor preached. So they are asked to attend a special class. When they are 10 and above, they will join us. Nonetheless, we can just figure out how difficult it was for this boy to come to the throne. He can't just sit on the throne and sleep, you know. He has to do some real work. And he's going to be surrounded by men who have been counselors and advisors to his, for, uh, his uh, forefathers. His father and grandfather. And these are the men who are going to guide them and they are all wicked. Many of them have followed idolatrous worship. They have weird away from the truth of God's word. There was nothing in that land that would keep this young boy in the knowledge and truth of God's word. Verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Verse 3, For in the eighth year of his reign, that, must, that means he was 16 years old, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God of David his father. David, his father, is reference to David, his great-great-grandfather. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places. He must have been by then twenty years. And the groves and the carved images and the molten image. At the age of sixteen, he understood how he must love God. How he must trust God. At the age of 20, he started to bring in reformation into the land. He started to get rid of all the molten images, all the graven images that filled the country. Tremendous young man. How I pray that all the young boys and girls who are growing in the church will rise up by faith and obedience to God's word in the days to come. That they will not allow anything of this world to come into their heart or into this church. 
The sad reality of most Protestant churches today is that when the fathers die off, the next generation wander away into the world. And they compromise and they let the world come in. And that we see in almost every church today. Most churches are trying to please the young crowd. So they want the worldly music and worldly dance and all kinds of nonsense in the church. Even the church pastors preach to entertain the crowd. A lot of jokes. I hear, you know, comments from people. You know, I love to hear this man because he jokes a lot. He's very funny. You should rather go and watch a comedian. How many jokes did, did Jesus crack? How many jo uh, jokes did Apostle Paul write in the Bible? Can you show me one? But modern pastors are more mindful of cracking jokes. Entertaining the crowd. This is a sad situation. This young man, Josiah, understood what it means to serve God. It is not to entertain the people. It is not to listen to the voice of the people. Now everybody in the country might want to serve the world, world's idols. Not to be with Josiah. He's going to be different. He was determined. Now God also acted providentially at this time. You know, this is very amazing. Now let's come to the passage that we read a while ago. Verse 14 of chapter 34 of Second Chronicles. Verse 14. Something was happening by God's providence in the temple of the Israelites. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. You know, priests are the custodians of the Bible. In the Old Testament, the priests are supposed to keep the word of God. In fact, the Ten Commandments uh, was kept in the ark, which was in the Holy of Holies. And the priests were supposed to read it and explain it to the people. And the law of Moses, which is mentioned in verse 14, I think is a reference to the first five books, including the Ten Commandments. And look at the way it is explained here. Verse 14 again, look at the last part of it. Hilkiah, the priest, found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. The book. What book? The book of the law of the Lord. The Bible is referred to as the law of the Lord. The word law in Hebrew is Torah, which means the teaching. God's insistence, God's instructions, God's statutes and commandments, they are written in the Bible. The Bible is to be regarded as the book of the Lord. The book of the law of the Lord. This is a wonderful book. You know why? Because this is authored by God. This is not Moses' book. This was the law of the Lord given by Moses. Yes, Moses penned it down. Not because he had all the idea to write it down. But the Lord gave it to him and said, Moses, write. And he wrote. This is the law of the Lord. How do you regard the Bible? It is the law of God. The law of the Lord. Given by God. A precious book indeed. There is no other book in the world that has this claim that God has given it but the Bible. It is the law of the Lord. This is a wonderful book that God has placed in our hands. My dear friends, well here it's a reference to the first five books written by Moses. But we know the Lord has progressively revealed more things through his prophets 
Christ and the apostles and they were added and they have 66 books now one thing we must know that in the history from the very beginning the devil and his minions have constantly tried to keep this word of God this revelation of God away from God's people and there were mighty men whether it be in the throne or in the temple whether they be kings or priests or prophets who deliberately hid God's word deliberately they did it so that they can continue in their sinful ways the reason why the priest Hilkiah was suddenly surprised by the discovery of this book was because it was not in his hand can you imagine a priesthood in the temple of God without having a copy of God's word this is utter darkness horrible pit of darkness can you imagine I'm coming to this pulpit having no word of God in my hand talking to you what maybe I can tell you the philosophies of the world I can talk to you about Hindu philosophy or the Muslim ideology or the atheistic philosophy but is it what God wants me to do no God appointed prophets and priests in order to preach what he has revealed to them not to talk about what they feel like but here is a situation in the history of Israel when Josiah came to the throne people were without the law of God all of a sudden here is a discovery somewhere one good priest of the past hid the word of God from being totally destroyed now I call this the preservation of the scripture kings that preceded Josiah were wicked kings they would do anything to destroy the Bible they would do anything to keep the truth away from God and all those priests most of them sang the same chorus of the wicked kings they served the king then the king of kings the Lord they serve the human purposes of their wicked kings than the divine purposes of the divine king. But when, by the grace of God, Josiah came to the throne, the providence of God brought out this wonderful truth in the form of the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Look at that phrase. Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord of course people would debate was this the autograph or was it the apograph now what is autograph autograph means the very first copy written by Moses himself apograph means it's a copy of it some other scribe has copied it you know in the house of the Lord there were priests as well as scribes now scribes were a very specially trained group of priests who would copy down every word of the word of God. They even number every word to make sure. They even number the letters to make sure every letter is copied. Meticulously they transferred. So we don't know whether it is the exact original or a copy of it whatever it is we are told it was the Word of God clearly the Word of God and nowhere said hmm is it an erroneous apograph no it was not in the first place now you must keep some things in mind very important things okay uh, let me tell you this there were deliberate effort from wicked kings and priests at that time to corrupt God's word not only to corrupt but to destroy it completely from the face of the earth but the singular providence of God kept pure his word for this young man who came to the throne to read it you see what happens let's come back to the text verse 15 Hilkiah, which is a priest who found the book, 
answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Oh, he was so happy. He suddenly burst out in joy and says, Oh, Shaphan, Shaphan, you want to copy the Bible. You are a scribe, but you don't have the, co the, 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 the copy to be copied. But I have found one. It's in the, in the temple. What did Hilkah do? Look at the end of verse 15. Hilkah delivered the book to Shaphan. What did Shaphan do? Look at verse 16. Shaphan carried the book to the king. And brought it to the king. And brought the king word back again. Saying all that was committed to thy servants. They do it. Because the king wanted to renovate the temple. And, and to remove all the images. And to... Um, you know, put everything in order according to God's word. So he said, we are doing all those things. And then when you come to verse 18, he says to the king, Hilkah the priest had given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. This is why God gave us the word. It is not to be hidden among the stones of the temple. If God has ever hid it, it was to protect it. So when his time comes, it will be taken out and to be read. You must understand this. This is God's preservation. This is how God worked in the history. There were times when people deliberately tried to corrupt the word. There were times when people deliberately tried to destroy the Bible. We know, we know it. It's true. But that does not mean God's word would fail. The word of the Lord endureth for ever. Jesus said one jot or one tittle shall fall. Jesus said my word shall not pass away. How can it be when there was a church that ruled over the Bible, subduing it, keeping it away from the people? How could it be when there was a thousand year period in the history of the church when men corrupted the Bible, knowingly or unknowingly? When there was deliberate effort by people to corrupt the copies of the Bible, do you think it's possible that the Bible can still be true? We are in a battle today because of various kinds of versions. You know, today there are so many Bible versions. KJV, NIV, NASB, and what, what not. I don't know. So many of them. Now there are women's Bible. Which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She maketh me to lie down. Because it's a feminist Bible. And what are the rubbish they are going to come up with? God knows. Soon you will have gay Bible too. And lesbian Bibles too. And they have already. This kind of corruption has been going on. And people in the church say, Oh, we shouldn't be so sure to say the Bible is perfect. We shouldn't be so sure to say the Bible has no mistake. Mm, in my clever intellectual opinion, this shouldn't be read this way. The King James Bible that we have in our hands is the faithful translation of the Hebrew and Greek Bible that God's servants in the Reformation time as regarded as God's word. How did they get it at the end of a thousand year, year period of corruption and wickedness and utter spiritual darkness? How did they get it? I, you and I have no need uh, to worry about this. Here, right before us, we have an amazing way in which God has preserved His Word. If you read through the Bible, you see this happening again in the time of Jeremiah and in the time of the apostles and so on. It keeps on happening in the history. You know, my dear friends, 
when God revealed His Word, He revealed the Word not to become an archive copy somewhere. He re revealed His truth and asked it to be written and copied so that it might be read by His people. So that they might know the way of salvation and then declare it to the ends of the world. And I want you to remember this. God has inspired His word and revealed it to God, God's people that it might be read by His people in all generations to come. It was not written so that it might be kept. If it cannot be kept, then it's destroyed. Sorry, rest of the people in the days to come will not have God's word. No, God's intention was this. That whatever He has revealed might stand to the ends of time. That God's people will always know what He has spoken in the ages past. In other words, listen to me carefully. God is with His book. You understand that? God is with His book. God's enemies may try to attack it. They may make copies and corrupt it, but God will not give up what He said. And He will make sure His words will not only be preserved and read clearly as it is to all His people. Blessed be His name. The kings and the priests who preceded Josiah were wicked. But God is by His singular protective providence. Is it not miraculous? Is it not special that when everybody is going against the Bible, when the king and the priest themselves are ang uh, unhappy with the word of God, the word of God is still preserved? That there was such a perfect copy in the, by, in the temple. <laughs> this is amazing. This is all too amazing. Now if you were to ask me to explain this further. I cannot. I rest in this wonderful knowledge. That nobody can attack the Bible to destroy it. They can try as hard as they may, as they may try, but they will never succeed. The word of the Lord endureth forever because God is with his book. Not one tittle of the Bible has failed or shall fail. It liveth and abideth forever. God is its author. God is its keeper. God is the revealer and he will make sure it will be heard to the ends of time. All of the words of the Bible is preserved. You know, dear friends, this is a precious book. This is a precious book. He authored it. He kept it. Have you ever found a book that is as old as this? Have you ever found a book that is so amazing? Written over a period of 1,600 years. By so many different men from different walks of life. So wonderfully unanimous, harmonious, kept by God's singular care. Have you ever found a book like this? Have you ever found a book that speaks about the beginning and the end of the world? You will never find one but this. This is such a holy book. This is such a sacred volume. This is such a amazingly divinely inspired and preserved word how do you regard your Bible 
I pray that you will take it every day in your hand and thankfully read and study it. Like what Shafa and the scribe did. We not only read for ourselves, we will read it for whoever God would assign us to read. If it is to the king, we shall read it to the king. If it is to the ministers of the land, then we shall read before the ministers. If we have to defend and preach it, no matter before any court or judge, we would do it. And we shall not be afraid. We will go with it to the ends of the world. We would not travel without it. But we will travel with it and for it. We will not live without it. We will live by it. Because this is God given for our benefit. To be read by us. Let's remember this. The preservation of God's word. Is a very important doctrine. Why? Because God's revelation of his word was intended to reach his people it is directed to us the preservation is a doctrine necessitated by the purpose of God in revealing his word the purpose of God in revealing his word was not to tell a few things to Moses and then let the, let the rest of the generation never know about it God revealed his word through Moses and the following prophets and apostles so that generations to come to the ends of the world might have it. It is directed to us. You know when God gave Moses the five books it was already in the mind of God. It must be taken up when the eight-year boy called Josiah come to the throne. And he must hear it. Yes or no? Was it in God's mind that God's child or God's king, when he comes upon the throne, no matter how young he would be, he must have it? Was it in his mind? Oh, yes. Now I ask you this question. Was it in God's mind when God revealed the first five books through Moses that Pastor Koshi on this day should take it in my hand and preach it? Yes or no? Was it in God's mind when Hilkiah the prophet drew this copy of the law from the stones of the pre, uh, temple and brought it to the king that I must read that same story today and explain it to you? It was. It was in God's mind. Otherwise I can't do it today. Imagine this. If God, God didn't have that in his mind. What would have happened? This book would have been destroyed long, long ago. It would have never reached us. The only reason it is in our hand. Because God has purposed it. From the very beginning he revealed it. That it must be directed to every child of God in the days to come. And God preserved it. And make no mistake, no matter what people scholarly speak of the Bible, there is nothing for us to fear. Well, you might have heard, I want to address a particular issue that troubles some Christians today about the preservation of the Bible. You might have heard people saying this, you know what? Not one single manuscript of the Bible agrees with one another this is a common statement and often a dangerous lie why should you and I worry about manuscripts you know why most people think, even today, only scholars can determine whether we have the Bible or not. They believe the way to find what the Bible is, to go by the modern scientific means to discover the Bible. In other words, you must dig into uh, all these 
potentially ar uh, archaeological, archaeologically potential sites. Uh, you must go into libraries, ancient libraries. You must look, in, look into caves where scribes lived and dig out all these ancient manuscripts, maybe hidden under the earth or somewhere in the cave and open it and study it then we can determine oh it's very important we must pray that things like uh, Isaiah's uh, uh, portion of the scripture which is known as Dead Sea Scrolls would come out somewhere sometime and then people can study it <laughs> some people are still waiting for more discoveries to find out what is God's word No. God has preserved his word through the church. Through God's people. God did not preserve his word by, uh, you know, getting some unbelieving, critically minded scholars to look for it in some places. Such people might have found some copies of the Bible here and there. But the way God preserved his word is through his people. How did Josiah find it? Because there was a godly priest who was sad about what's going on. And by God's providence, everyone was working at the same time. Hilkiah, Shaphan, and Josiah. God's providence helped them to work together. When you look at the Reformation period, you see the same thing. How God raised certain men at the right place at the right time and put them together. And we have what we call the Textus Receptus, which is the Greek Bible behind the English Bible that we use, which means received text. Received by who? Scholars? No. Received by the church. That's what it means. The King James Bible we have is the only English Bible that is available today, or widely in use, that is based completely on Textus Receptus received Bible this was received by the reformers and godly men of that time and we are so happy that we have it, it today if you and I were to go back and look at all these manuscripts first of all we don't know Greek as much as the reformers knew it they were not only men who spoke Greek and they were knowledgeable and about all they were godly men renewed and revo revived and raised by God in, in his time at the end of the dark age of Christian church so that they might rediscover the Bible which was actually in the hands of God's people. They paid for this book with their life. They were defending it and they were keeping it. And God has brought it together. I'm not saying the Bible come together in 1611 no the Bible was always there but because the Catholic Church was hiding it from the people and many scribes corrupting it it was not known you see at this point of time according to our text Josiah's priest and scribe suddenly discovered it does that mean that the Bible was not there all this while no it was there because they were not interested in the Bible they didn't find it but when there was a king who was interested in it by God's gracious appointment God's providence brought it up so I want you to go away thinking this not worrying about the perfect perfect nature of the Bible but that God who is perfect kept his word perfectly to the end I have nothing to worry God has given me the word infallible ignorant as it was even today and we must believe it with all our heart because we see God working throughout the history to pro to protect his word and make no mistake my dear friends we have a Bible that God has inspired and we don't read some human words. This Bible is more precious than all the gems and diamonds of the world. This is a treasure house of God's wisdom. You know, we must be very thankful that this book is so easily available today. Some of the books that our children buy for the uh, 
studies, education purposes are so expensive, isn't it? Some are hard to find. And even if they are to be found, they are expensive. Now the Bible is made so freely available to you today. This is because God has intended it to be in your hands. And I would say this to you, my dear friends. We must be like Shaphan the scribe. You know what we should do? We must love to proclaim this book that is so peculiarly preserved by God. It must be your delight to read it to your children, parents, grandparents. It must be your delight to take the Bible in your hands and read it to your children. Do you want to give a birthday gift? Give a Bible. You want to give a wedding gift? Don't think too much. Give a Bible. Whether Christian or non-Christian. Give it to them. Because you can't give anything better than this. This is preserved and handed down by God's singular protective care. Would you look down on it? This is the best gift you can give. Give it to your boss. Give to someone who help you. It's if you have lost your bunch of key and somebody picks it up and give it to you, don't worry what to, how to reward him. Give him a Bible. If you lost your handphone somewhere and somebody picks it up and bring it to you and say, I found your phone. Are you the owner? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. I'm so glad. You know what? My entire address book is inside. Thank God you found it, huh? Please bring it to me. I don't know how to say thank you. No, you know how to say thank you. Buy a Bible and give to him. You better read it. You better propagate it. It is your duty if you believe God has placed it in your hand. Hilkiah's duty is not to treasure the Bible and keep it in his shelf. His duty is to bring it to the scribe who is appointed by God's own appointment to distribute the Bible. And here he comes before the king and reads it. What is a Bible Presbyterian's job? It's not to take the Bible and come home. You know, the other day somebody cracked this joke. I don't like jokes, but uh, it's an interesting joke that somebody told me in the church office. You know, pastor, the Roman Catholics worship the Bible. They keep it on the shelf and, and kiss it and go. But many Protestants in these days, you know what they do with the Bible? Come to church under the armpit and then reach, go back home and put it back. And then next Sunday take it under the armpit and come to church. I hope you are not that kind of Protestant. To just to show that you are going to church. This must be our delight to read. Read it loud for ourselves. You know, I often think I would not live to see my grandchildren uh, because of all my sickness. But if God were to give me enough length of time to live on this earth, and if I have an opportunity to see grandchildren, I don't know whether I will have or not, but if God would give me grandchildren, I want to tell them all the stories of the Bible. I want to lift the name of Jesus. I want to tell them the gospel, not only to my children and their children. And I want to tell my children, and all of you, my dear brethren, you are my spiritual children in a way, my brothers and sisters in Christ. What's the greatest gift you want to give to your children? Are you thinking about bank balances? Are you thinking about cars and houses? Give to them the Bible. Assure their hearts in the truth of God's word. Tell them this is the word that is, to, that is to live by. This is what God gave to us to live by it. Live by it. Live by it. You see, when they started to read, there was a real reformation coming. 
Do you know something, dear, dear friends? We often say Martin Luther was the great reformer. John Calvin was a great reformer. But there is something that reformed the reformers. Do you know what? The Bible. This is the real reformer. This is what brings about reformation. Martin Luther didn't bring reformation. God's word, sola scriptura, brought reformation. This is what made Europe, Europe. Europe was a continent of utter darkness. Morally, it was despicable, violent. Barbarians lived, killing, brutally killing. They worship idols of all kinds. But do you know what set Europe free? How it became a society of freedom? How it became an intellectual society? It is the light of the Bible that the reformers preached. This is the book that reformed. But today they depart from this. And so the atrocity returns to the world. How can you reform your children? How can you reform your grandchildren? How can we reform ourselves? We have a corrupt heart. Look at this. Let's see. Verse 19. Second Chronicles 34, 19. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes. This is amazing. The royal garb was torn asunder because the royal voice of the one that sitteth upon the throne, God Almighty, was red. Josiah says, My pur purple garb studded with diamonds and gems are useless if my life is stained with sin, if my life is marred with disobedience and rebellion, if my kingdom is a token of rebellion against God, what is this garb? Let it go. You know, my dear friends, if you're alive, because you call yourself Christians and members of Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church, is marred with disobedience of the Bible, I find no joy in calling pastor and wearing this suit and tie and come and stand here i rather don't have it be naked and die in some wilderness i did not become a pastor to have your i have a salary from you i did not come to this pulpit to be entertained by you not to eat your food but to declare the voice of god and I want it to be clear in no uncertain terms. This is a book that is intended to bring about reformation. To put a stop to the wanderings and backslidings of the people. To call them to that which pleases the Lord. That which is holy. This book alone will open the window toward heaven. This alone will show you the way to heaven. The rest of the ways are to destruction. So here Josiah standing before the word of the Lord rends his clothes. And what does he say? Verse 20. The king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Abdon the son of Micah and Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah a servant of the king saying go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord and do after all that is written in this book this king became so excited. He calls all the scribes and the sons of the scribes. Because they are 
they are trained in this tradition of copying the law. They are experts of the law. If there are anyone in the land who is con concerned about the truth of God's word, who is excited and knowledgeable about God's word, bring them. Because I heard the word of God. I know we have provoked God to wrath. This is dangerous. I want people to tell me. I want people to educate me how to walk in the pleasure of God. How to walk in, in the way that pleases the Lord. I cannot live this way. Christians. One of the things that make me very sad in these days. Is the unbiblical lifestyle of Christians. I have said repeatedly over the past few years, the past few weeks, and I've always said that to you, at least for the last 15 years. It's not good enough to believe that God has inspired His Word. It's not good enough to believe that God preserved His Word. It's not good enough to believe that, that verbally, plenary Bible is preserved. We must know the purpose of it. It is to reform us. Because we are totally depraved. We are a corrupt people. Our tendency is to sin and sin and sin. Our tendency is to embrace the world. Is to live like the world. You know how sad it is to see that in modern churches, people are living in sin and sin and sin. So filthy. Churches are filled with young people who are so immodestly dressed. They show off the flesh. They hardly cover up the flesh. They are so living in sin. Committing fornication. You know, in Singapore, it's an open secret anyway. Teenage pregnancies are common. Premarital sex is so rampant. And this is not outside the church, I tell you. This is happening within the church. Adultery and fornication is a common thing. And I know even BP pastors and elders' children before marriage go for holiday together. The boy and girl are holidaying together and living in the same room before marriage. You can't say anything about it. They will quit the church. If you say anything about it, you are not an understanding pastor. You are an old-fashioned man. Useless. Pastors and elders can take the youth fellowship and go and watch filthy movies produced by Hollywood. And then can talk about Hollywood movies from the pulpit. When did God has allowed Hollywood unbelieving people, corrupt, immoral, adulterous, drug addicts to determine what our people in the church should believe? I'm talking about Bible Presbyterianism. Don't talk about charismatics. They have gone long ago. Don't talk about Anglicans. They got... Mm, homosexual bishops already. Don't talk about Catholics. That's gone. They got pedophile priests already. And we are not behind too far. We are right behind them. Catching up. We say we believe in the Bible. But we don't yield to the Bible. How sad it is. Look at verse 29. What did this king do? Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small, and he read in their ears. All the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. Look at that statement. Whoa. Reformation. May God grant Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church a reformation. May God grant it to us. Because I don't see that kind of excitement in many of us. 
I thank God for a few who still have such great eagerness. Where are you when there is adult Bible study in this church? Where are you when there is weekly prayer meetings and Bible studies? Where are you? It is required of me to speak into your ears. But you don't want to come. You have opened your ears to the rest of the world. You are busy doing that and this. You say, I got a lot to study. Yeah. God has given you a mind to study. And now you don't want to hear God's word. You say, you got a lot of work to do. Yeah. God has given you enough grace to work. So you don't need God anymore. You have turned every blessing that God gave you an idol. You serve your idols. You serve your kitchens. You serve your offices. You serve your entertainment box. TV. You serve everything, but you don't serve your God anymore. Reformation is needed in me. Reformation is needed in you. Dear friends, time is running off. Not only for this service. But for your life. We are running very, very hard and fast to the end. These are utterly wicked days. You take the Bible, you come to church, but it has nothing to do with you. Verse 31, And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord. To walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul. To perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. This is reformation. A resolute heart. A heart that is consecrated entirely to do God's will. This is the path of blessing. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But he that meditate upon the word of the Lord. This is the what it is. Here King Josiah, young as he may be, empowered by the reading of God's word, by the hearing of God's word, Empowered by the Holy Spirit who draw his heart to the word of God. And he stands without shame. And he calls upon all the silent priest and the wavered priest. He calls all the elders, come back to the house of the Lord. And what does he do? Not only he made a covenant for himself with the Lord. Verse 32 says, he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God and the God of their fathers. Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel. And made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. How I pray to the Lord. That as I remain to be your pastor by God's grace alone. That it will never be said of us that we said there is a Bible and that we didn't obey it. I pray that the Bible will not be hidden from your view. I pray that the Bible will not be hidden from your hearing. I pray that the Bible's light will not be cast elsewhere but in your path. I pray that all of you will walk in the blessedness of the law of the Lord. So that all the abominations and preoccupation with the world will go. My dear brother, my dear sister. The way God is going to prosper you and to use you mightily for his kingdom. Is by the way of the book. The book and reformation. It doesn't matter whether you are young like Josiah, whether you are weak, whether you are ignorant. If you are called by the Spirit of God right now, 
you now turn your thoughts toward God where you are. From the seat that you are sitting now, turn your thoughts toward God and say, Lord, guide my heart by thy truth and reform my spirit that I may be like Josiah to walk all the days of my life to declare it and to propagate it. And this is what we should be. May God help us.